you. Okay. All day long, we've been hearing this HTML5 thing mentioned without really seeing what it's about. So for this last session, we're going to hear uh, a little bit about the core of HTML5 and how it works. Um, I have some HTML5 uh, stickers that I brought with me. Unfortunately, I don't have enough uh, to hand out to everybody. So it, in the spirit of W3C's uh, consensus building process, I'm going to put them outside at the reception and you can scratch and claw <laughs> to get them. So for this last session, uh, Paul Irish will be telling us about the foundations of the web platform. Uh, Paul is a developer relations person for Google Chrome and uh, in a, yet another uh, news flash for this first W3C developer conference, Paul's announced that henceforth he's going to be dropping all the vowels from his last name and he'll go by Paul Rush. So everybody please welcome Paul Rush to the stage. Thank you. Cool. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I want to talk about HTML5. And so this is going to be a talk about HTML5 as, as a thing that everything else that's awesome gets built on top of. And as such, it's more of a talk about kind of the primitives of HTML5. So it's not going to, I'm not going to show any flashy demos at all, which is kind of a bummer because I like flashy demos and that's a lot of fun. We're going to see some of those from Giorgio tomorrow, but today we're going to talk about kind of like what HTML5, is from a, what HTML5 means from a browser perspective and kind of what's going on underneath the covers uh, making such a rich platform for us. So um, like Ian mentioned, I work on the Google Chrome team and I, I do developer relations. Um, uh, with David Yamanian, I uh, created the HTML5 boilerplate and lead that project. I'm also the lead developer modernizer. I'm on the jQuery team and I like making the web fun um, as much as I can. So the way that we're going to kind of talk about this is with this document right here. So this is HTML5 document. It's got some stuff in it. Um, we're going to kind of use this basic document as how we're going to kind of structure this conversation around HTML5. And we're going to kind of start from the top of it, if that's cool. Starting with the doc type. And to start with the doc type, I need to introduce this place. Uh, does anyone know what this place is? Yeah, so this, is, um, this is Cafe Centro. This is in San Francisco, a little cafe, cute cafe. And um, this was the, the location of a conversation that happened between two people um, that has to do with the doc type. So what happened is um, Todd Farner, who uh, was a web standards guy, and back in 1998, the summer of 1998, he sat down for a coffee with Tantek Celik. And the two of them were talking about things because what had happened is that there was a lot of movement around web standards, and, and, and basically there was an, uh, a new um, rendering um, and layout um, path that had to happen in browsers. And what that meant is that there was going to be essentially what, what could be we could break the web if, if we move into this, this new uh, rendering method. And Todd had an idea, and, and that was to use the doc type as a way to indicate that we were going to use the new way and not the old way. And so in addition to um, talking to, to Tantec, he uh, also went over, um, Tantec at the time was uh, on the IE5 team uh, for Mac at, and, at Microsoft. And then um, over, this is on a, a, a Mozilla mailing list, Todd brought up the same thing. And I just want to read out a little bit of this. Uh, here we go. Please consider taking a modal approach. Ship a browser with two independent rendering systems. Use a legacy system for legacy content. Use ng layout, the new system, when rendering documents authored in either for strict or XML. Pay attention to the doc type. Encourage authors to use HTML4 strict or XML and outline, outline a plan to phase out the legacy renderer. Um, which sounded, you know, pretty good. And so I think the interesting thing here is that um, Thus far, there was a doc type, right? There was a doc type in HTML. This came over from SGL. And that was just kind of like hanging out there. Um, and you needed it if you wanted your pages to validate. But like browsers, eh, 
didn't really care. I mean, it was, it was just there, it's chilling. And Todd was like, we could use that thing that's not doing anything and use that as a way for people to opt in, right? So this is doc type switching. And Tontech, when he heard that at Cafe Central, he was like, yeah, sounds, sounds pretty good. Um, they're also like, yeah, we could use this as a way to kind of evangelize web standards. You're opting in, use the doc type, you're in standards mode, not quirks mode. And Tontech prototyped it and went out in some IE5 betas. Um, and then it shipped in IE5 Mac. At the same time, um, Mozilla was discussing it on Bugzilla. And I really like uh, what happened because on the Bugzilla thread, there was kind of a back and forth uh, between David Barron and uh, Ian Hickson. And they were starting to discuss, like, what are all the different doc types and what are, what are their behavior? And so, like, down about here, yeah. Hixie uh, was identifying, so these ones actually trigger a quirks mode, these trigger a, a strict mode, because it's true that not just having any doc type triggers standards mode, but only some, right? So um, some of that actually went into the, to the HTML5 spec, so you can go and view. These are the doc types that do, in fact, trigger and have to trigger quirks mode. All right, so, um, but what happened in HTML is that there were these big, um, this is the XHTML1 transitional doc type. The DTD is essentially uh, uh, optional. But, but in HTML5, they're like, you know, let's take a look at how all browsers handle this. And we were able to shorten it. But the thing was is that the HTML5 doc type is not designed so much as it's just discovered. And it was just like, if all browsers treat this the same way, then we can just go with this short, nice, Memorable thing. Uh, the next thing after the doc type that I want to touch on is the meta car set. Um, and so this is essentially what it was like, right? We have this HTTP equiv. I don't even know. I don't know what that. And anyways, this is not something that I ever learned to memorize. But what happened is that um, browsers handled this a little funnily because authors not always so good with the details like quotations and ooh. So what happened is that sometimes an author would leave off the quotation marks on their, on their meta car set. And then something would happen like this, where uh, the syntax highlighted and actually points it out pretty well, which is instead of this big quote um, that encapsulates all of this, uh, there's no quote. And car set is essentially interpreted as an extra attribute. And what browsers were doing at the time were like saying, you know what, it's okay if you leave those off. And if you do, we still want to make sure that that character encoding happens because that's actually really important. So we'll let that happen. So in HTML5, we just made sure that all the browsers were doing this um, and said, you know, essentially, if there's an extra attribute that is car set and its value is UTF-8 or, or whatever, I mean, we'll just take that and use that as the content type for the, for the document. So that's another thing from HTML5 that's not designed so much as just discovered. Um, I do want to point out that it is important for, you always need to define the character encoding um, for your document. And I encourage you to put it before the, the title tag. And this is something that we do in the HTML5 boilerplate. The reason why is because of UTF-7. And UTF-7 is, it's some nasty stuff, but it basically allows for a cross-site scripting attack. And Mark Pilgrim was the, uh, wrote about this uh, most comprehensively over at uh, the old Google Doc type site. And what essentially it is, is this is a UTF-7 script tag. Notice the lack of angle brackets, right? And angle brackets is usually how you're like, oh, that's HTML. And angle brackets followed by maybe script is like, um, that's probably bad, and I'm going to make sure that I don't have that. And in this case, um, no angle brackets, right? Um, and so what Internet Explorer used to do is it would read the first 512 bytes of the document, and it saw that. And it was like, oh, I think that's UTF-7. I'm just going to parse this whole thing as, um, as that. And then it would, could execute this script. So it, essentially, if you had a user input and it made its way into um, the title tag, and your stuff didn't catch it because there's no angle brackets, um, you could get a cross-site scripting vulnerability via UTF-7 without a predefined character encoding. A little complicated, but it's pretty cool at the same time. All right, <clears throat> going back to this. So we've covered doc type and car set. But you know, the one thing that's happening that I haven't really mentioned is that there's this, it's essentially a text file, right? 
And we have these angle brackets, and we have these tag names and, and, and attributes. But really, a browser has to take that text file and turn it into those things. So that introduces us to the concept of parsing, right? So HTML markup goes through a parser and then turns into a DOM. And another way to look at this uh, without the cartoon would be to, to look at what the HTML5 spec says. So this is a diagram from that. Data comes in over the network, goes in through the tokenizer. Tokenizer is like, OK, this is a little angle bracket. This is um, a, a, a letter. And then there's a space. So that's probably the tag name. It parses that out, <clears throat> constructs a tree. And then we have to go check that tree to see if we have script tags because the enemy of the DOM, which is document.write, we just got to make sure, hey, do you have any document write? Because if you do, then I got to do all this extra work because you're a jerk. Document write is a jerk. Uh, and then we go back through that loop. And then finally, we have a DOM. Ta-da. So the parsing is complicated, right? And the thing is that for a long time, you know, browsers didn't really agree on how to do it. And it was just kind of like black magic. So a long time ago, Ian Hickson, this was back in uh, 2002, um, he wrote about, he tried to document how browsers handle markup that is invalid and has mismatching tags. So here we have a uh, body element and then a paragraph, and then we have some text nodes, an M address, and they're mismatched. I6, this is the, the tree that it constructed um, with a beautiful, beautiful diagram uh, created by Ian. Uh, looks good. So basically, we have the P and the M are siblings, and the address is a child of the M tag. Cool. Over in Mozilla, um, the M and the address are siblings, but then there's another M element completely that's also a child of the second. OK. And then Opera was different because the address is just a child of the M, and then that's. So clearly, not much interoperability here. Um, but, you know, that would be nice, right? So uh, Ian took another look at it. This is, um, again, in, I think, 2006, uh, trying to document how this works. And he actually ended up writing a tool for it. Um, because he wanted to see, you know, quickly, what is the DOM that's constructed? And so um, the live DOM viewer came out of that. And the live DOM viewer um, is essentially that. I can uh, type out any sort of HTML. Hi guys. And um, let's see, we'll do a P and then hey mom, you rock span. Awesome. Whoa. Okay, so I'm gonna leave off the yeah, okay, there we go. Good. So we get a little DOM here. And the way that this works is it's just throwing this uh, this HTML right here into an iframe and pulling out the DOM from that iframe. So we get a real-time view of how this browser treats that markup. And so then, as a result, we can, we can understand how this is happening. But the interesting thing that I noticed is that this here, this DOM view, I don't think, you know, Ian wrote this because there was no way to do this before. And this is like the first time that we had a, a view into what was happening at a DOM level. Um, usually, you know, you, you write your markup and then you could view source, but viewing source is not the DOM. So here we actually could see what, what was going on in the DOM. Curiously enough, um, three months later, there was a little tool that was starting to debut called Firebug. And uh, so Joe Hewitt was putting out Firebug right around this time. And uh, so it looks, only his DOM looked like this. And I do, I do just want to point this out, that the, the, the DOM view in Firebug and WebKit Web Inspector, it has angle brackets, right? That's, I mean, that's just because it looks nice. It's not because a DOM doesn't have angle brackets. Um, it just looks kind of cool to look like it's HTML, even though a DOM is not, a DOM is a representation of HTML, but it's not really HTML itself. But, you know, it's very friendly. So, <clears throat> but the thing is that we, Ian really wanted to tackle this. So we spent a lot of time figuring out how we can standardize the parsing of all this broken markup. And um, before HTML5, this had never happened. But HTML5 did, in fact, define the exact parsing of any arbitrary markup. And I just want to show, share this little clip from uh, that Opera put out just recently. One of the most interesting for developers things about HTML5, but actually the least sexy side of it from a demo perspective, 
is the fact that if a browser implements the HTML5 algorithms, doesn't even matter if your web page has broken markup, it will always be the same in every browser. Um, it's just called the HTML5 parser. There's a labs build on all. Yeah. So, uh, so this is really cool because we now have this exact same parser, exact same parser, in Opera, in Chrome, Firefox 4, Safari 5.1, and IE 10. And uh, Bruce, who we just saw, also said that there are two main uh, effects of this. Uh, JavaScripters will sport cheerful grins and bouffant hair. Absolutely true. And consumers can expect fewer interoperability problems when using their favorite site. In fact, Opera found out that 20% um, of the compatibility problems that people were facing using Opera just disappeared using the new, uh, using the new parser. So it works out really well. Lastly, I just want to point out that the parser um, has a reference implementation, and that is um, called HTML5lib. And so HTML5lib is a reference implementation of the parser. It's written in Python. Um, and there's also a, another live DOM viewer. And uh, this is over at validator.new. And the interesting thing, it looks very similar to the one that we saw from Hixie. But the interesting thing with this one is that instead of taking the, the markup here and throwing it into an iframe and seeing out what the, uh, the render DOM is, is that we have uh, this, this, this script tag here. If you look at this JavaScript, it is some nasty stuff. Look at, look at, ew, weird. Anyways, this is um, a GWT, a Google Web Toolkit compilation of a Java implementation of the HTML5 parser. Um, so that's pretty cool. There's actually a few different ports of the exact same parser. I've been documenting them over here on the wiki. Um, so there's a Python one, the Java one that um, that, that compilation was made from. And uh, David Flanagan over at Mozilla just created a, a pretty new one. It's in DOM.js. Looks really good. So um, if you are doing any sort of screen scraping, I would recommend to use one of these, because you can be guaranteed that the DOM that's constructed matches exactly what browsers think. And, uh, and that feels pretty good to know that. All right, <clears throat> cool. Coming back to this guy. Uh, if you look at this document, you might notice that I'm omitting a few things that typically you see in HTML. Like, anyone's in particular? Yeah, HTML. HTML, yes. Yes, I'm, I, there's no HTML tag. And that's because there's, there, it's optional. You don't need to do it, really. Um, so there's, in HTML5, there's a few optional things, even in HTML4. Um, HTML tag, head, body, call group, T body. T body sometimes catches you. you. Like, you write a child selector, or you're writing child selectors, you're like table TR, TD, and you're trying to select that, and you're putting the child selectors between it and it totally breaks because, because the browser injected a T-body in there. It catches you. But I want to show you, this is actually the WebKit source here. Um, and this is treebuilder.cpp. We, uh, we get in a new token. We're reading a token, and it says, hey, if it's a TR tag, then process fake start tag T-body. It's like, hey. You, I got a TD, I, I got a TR? Okay, just make sure that there's a T-body. Do a fake one if you need to. Um, so like, browsers construct that on your behalf if, if you don't leave it in. So <clears throat> there's also optional end tags. You don't always need to close off uh, your elements if you don't want. You can leave off uh, HTML head and body. Lists, I, I like not, not closing these. Also a lot of table stuff. Um, also P and option, but I would close your P's. Feels, feels good, feels good. Check this out. So like at the top here, a basic list, not closing off my LIs. Looks good, feels good, I like this. Down here I have a more complex example, right? A, a table, and I kind of have the columns all lined up. I'm not closing off my T-head, my T-body. Uh, ooh, yeah, I, just, I really like the feel of that. And, I, and it's fine if like you don't, like you're looking at that, just please just close those, those are driving me crazy. That's fine, I mean, so, I think this is more maintainable. I think that's the most important part. Like, what is the most maintainable for you and your team, right? Not, I mean, the, the important part, the part that I'm trying to make, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that IE6 constructs the exact same DOM out of this as every other browser. Like, this is interoperable. 
totally. There's no problem. You can feel very confident writing HTML like this and having it come out to look good. So leaving off tags like that, you can construct some kind of minimal markup, right? Um, it's really tiny. This is the, the most minimal HTML5 document you can get away with, uh, with content at least. Um, one could say, you could say that this is the real HTML5 boilerplate. You could. But I, I might have a problem with that. But like, so this is cool, right? I could tell you that this is, this is what you could get away with. But this actually is being used. These tricks are being used in production. If you go to the, the Google's 404 page, uh-huh, and let's see, view source, view source, view source. Thank you. All right, cool. Um, they actually do do an HTML uh, element just to set the language. It's fine. But no head. We don't need head. Don't need quotes. Um, we end up having a really big data URI. Um, down at the bottom, though, we have some P's that we don't close off. We don't close off the body of the HTML. It's good. It's cool. Works. Works fine everywhere. All right. <clears throat> cool. All right. Coming back to this guy. Um, inside this script, we have one of the best things that I think that we got going on, this little guy right here. And this is, inner HTML is kind of enabled by parsing and, and what we were just talking about. So I want to talk a little bit about H, uh, inner HTML. But to do that, we're going to go into the past, a little, little trip back into the past. So back a while ago, we had what we call the DOM level zero API. We had these four methods. Create element, create text node, append child, and insert before. And um, who's used, who's typed out like a create text node before? And like who, when, when you did that, did you, you were like, do I really need to create a text node to put text into a div? This is like, I have a div. I want to put text into it. Why do I need to create a node that holds the text that I've been putting the div? And I was just like, I got so frustrated. So just as an example, <clears throat> we're going to take this little string of text, right? Um, we got a P, and Tim is saying hello, and there's strongs and Ms. Pretty cool. Using that DOM level zero API, we have something that looks, looks a little bit like this. But hello. How are you doing? Inner HTML? Oh, yeah. Just Toss it the exact string that you want. Works. I want to touch on kind of like how InterHTML came into being, because I think it's pretty cool. So we're back in 1996. I have this uh, little timeline down here uh, created by Divya Manian. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's going to keep track of this along a timeline for us. All right, <clears throat> 96. Eric Vasilik, he's on the Trident team at, uh, at Microsoft, comes up with InterHTML, also intertext, outer HTML. Um, Outer HTML, which just landed in Firefox like last two weeks ago, I think, something like that. Also, these other methods, thought they'd be a good idea. Pretty good idea. They shipped with IA4. This is 1997. Everyone was super happy. Also, dynamic, dynamic HTML came out because it was like all this good stuff. And developers were like, sweet, this Internet HTML stuff is pretty awesome. Now we go over to Mozilla, and there's this thing called Create Contextual Fragment, which is which is funny. <laughs> I asked someone about it, and, and I was asking, like, why and where and why this instead of that? So Henry Sivanen uh, said this. He said, create contextual fragment predates HTML and Gecko. This was back in the era when IEisms were bad. But creating your own vendor-specific ad hoc APIs was super cool. <laughs> so yeah, so this is the API. So first we create a range. Uh, and then um, we kind of set a context. We have our string. And then we take that range and we call create contextual fragment on it. And then we pass in the string. And that returns a document fragment. And then the document fragment has that DOM stuff. And then we can drop that into the container. And if you've worked with the document fragment, it's pretty cool. It's like this, like, this mysterious gel-like substance that holds DOM. And when you drop it into your page, it like, disappears and dissolves. And you're like, yes. Thank you. You did your job. So, so if we bring back up this timeline, so September 97, uh, uh, IE4 shipped with InterHTML. It wasn't until June 99 when Create Contextual Fragment came out. Developers had been like, hey, we would like that thing. And Mozilla's like, 
Totally, we'll give you create contextual fragment, finally. And then like right afterwards, they're like, so thanks for create contextual fragment, but I'm gonna file a ticket because I want that real thing now, thanks very much. <clears throat> and I really like this. I, over in this Bugzilla ticket, um, you look down and there's this, this comment and it says, here's an example of the horrid contortions people are going to try and get around this bug, lack of a badly needed feature, for DHML developers. And um, so Eric Ardvinson, who uh, now he works on the Chrome team, at the time he was the world's best DHTML hacker, essentially. And he created a polyfill for inner HTML. And I just want to show this because I think it is so rad. <clears throat> so I think we're using like JavaScript 1.6 setters or something. Um, and we're augmenting the HTML prototype, HTML element prototype to inner HTML. And we're doing the exact same thing. We're creating a range. We're using create contextual fragment. We get our string. We pass it in. And this works. And it just mimics the exact same API. It's pretty cool. But, you know, people weren't happy with it. And of course it makes sense to have this in the platform. So <clears throat> two months later, Mozilla is like, okay, you got it, guys. I just want to watch this timeline as, as we zoom out to the next date. Ooh. Yeah. Not till October 2007 when InterHTML was finally specified. It took a long time. But then it was, and all was good. And I do just want to bring up this concept of tags versus elements just, just, just because I need to. And it's like, the first, the thing that is important is that what I'm about to tell you, just don't like try and correct someone else when they say something because you will get punched in the face and, it's okay, and, and, they, and you deserve it, okay? <laughs> so people have tried to define the difference between tags versus elements. And so this guy, he said, an element is a single chunk of code comprising of an opening and closing tag. Uh, so this is a div element, not a div tag. And then tags are the bits that make up elements. Div is a tag. An opening and closing tag makes an element. Yeah. First of all, <clears throat> it's not opening and closing tags. It's start and end tags, thanks. I mean, seriously. But I, I mean, whatever. So. It's, it's complicated. Um, so I'm going to try and demonstrate like, what, this, what the real difference is. OK. We're going to create a div. Um, yes. Yes. Good. <clears throat> In this div, we will put a span. Just chilling. In this div, it's. Pretty sweet. Oh, span. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So, cool, cool. Div, outer HTML. Oh, yeah. All right. <clears throat> this is a tag, right? And it's a tag because it's in a string. So, tags exist in string space. Elements aren't strings. Elements are representations of DOM. They're representations of a thing in memory. It's like an object. If I type div, then even in the, the Chrome Dev Tools, it tries to convince me that it has tags. And that's not even true. It's a lie to me. I'm going to use console.dir. Pretty little handy guy. Yeah, like this. Yeah. Sweet. Ah, yeah. This is an element. Element's got all this other stuff going on, like the the, con the data set and the first child, the first element child, that's an element. And the fact that we look over here and we look in the elements tab and then we see a bunch of, ta uh, we, we see a bunch of tags inside here, it's, it's all a ruse. It's the world. It's the wool being pulled over your eyes. It's lying to you. I mean, but it's, I mean, you get it. You get it. Anyways, that's the difference between tag and element. Please don't. Because the thing is, if you were to correct someone and they would punch you, and then that would hurt. But the thing is, like, for 10 years, we were talking about how on your images, you really need um, your alt tags. And, like, don't forget your alt tags. It's alt attributes. <laughs> like, it really matters. I mean, we've been fine calling it the wrong thing forever. No big deal. Anyways, OK, that's all settled and done. And the last thing I want to point out, which I think is pretty rad, is this last bit, which is a little hard to see. 
So essentially, this last line, we grab this pre-tag. That's what we're doing right here. We're going to set the text content of that pre-tag to the document.document .document element outer HTML. Document element refers to essentially the HTML element, which is not even defined in my markup, but it is in my DOM. And then we're going to grab the outer HTML. And what that does is it does that one extra thing. So far, we've talked about markup going through a parser into the DOM. Um, and we've talked about taking new HTML and throwing it in through inner HTML as a setter that goes back through the parser and goes into the DOM. But now we can talk about using uh, inner HTML or outer HTML as a getter and we get serialized HTML. And this is the pretty cool thing, because previous to InterHTML's debut, the concept of taking a chunk of DOM and serializing it into HTML didn't exist. It was like a one-way street. You could take InterHTML and go into a DOM, and then there was no way to get that back out into something that like, looked readable, like looked like your language. It was pretty cool. And I think I should just show this demo page uh, once and for all. Um, the, page, the document that we've been looking at this whole time. I'm just going to view the source again because, yeah, OK. The source this is what we've been looking at. So the important part is that we're going to populate the content of this pre uh, element with the outer HTML of the entire document. So this is what we get. <clears throat> we do get the optional tags that we never specified in our markup because we just serialized the whole thing. And so we have the HTML element and the head and the body and all the closing tags, too. All right. So now that we have a good understanding of parsing, of optional tags, of the DOM and the difference between markup and, and DOM, we have some like, cool stuff that we can do. Because we have interoperability, and we can get away with some cool stuff that we might have been like, a little scared of before. The first one, I just think this one's rad. This is the world's like shortest text editor. Take this guy. It's a little data URI. <clears throat> and you pop that into your browser. Looks like nothing until, oh yeah, oh yeah. How are you doing? Um, pretty cool. So like, you know, if you just want to like demo some uh, code or whatever, you could just, that's all you need. And you get, it's nice and fixed width too. Um, pretty handy. Also, I get this question sometimes. People ask me, so um, what, what can you use as IDs in your markup? And you can use more than just letters if you want. And in fact, so the HTML spec says you can use anything. And that's cool. And so actually, if you use anything, you use get element by ID, it works totally fine. So you can use like a smiley face, that's good. Um, but over in CSS, the CSS spec kind of disagrees with the HTML spec over here. And he says uh, it's actually very specific. <clears throat> so identifiers can only contain the characters that and ISO that thing and then the thing and then the. Anyways, what this means is that you can use the letters and the numbers and you can use, you can't use essentially things that you would usually hold down shift on your keyboard to type without escaping it. But then, in this, this little ISO something, something in higher, I don't know what this means. Um, what that means is these guys. You can use like happy Unicode guy and the Unicode snowman and everything. <laughs> so I worked, uh, I worked with my friend Matias Bienes and he made a little test suite where we can just verify that in fact all this stuff does work. So a heart as an ID, or a smiley face, a snowman. I really like this one. This is a, like you could have like a little song with your Unicode uh, <laughs> characters, and like each paragraph could be a different little jingle. Uh, and in fact, so like right over here is the CSS selector. And you don't even need to like escape these. You just put them in as literal into your CSS, assuming everything's UTF-8, and you're all good. Um, if you want any help with this, Matthias made a nice little um, one-page web app called Mother Effing CSS Escapes, <laughs> where you can just type in whatever um, ID you want to use, and, uh, and then it can tell you exactly how to escape the selector for here, how you use it with get only by ID and query selector all, handy, handy stuff. The other thing that I really, really like is um, using quote-free attributes. 
I don't know about you. So, like, so when I type HTML like this, like, I love it. Like, I feel so good. Like, it's like, it's like walking around in, in your apartment with no clothes, and you're just like, it's good. Like, it's a little risky. You feel like a little, <laughs> right? But at the same time, you're like, oh, those quotes were just weighing me down. So, like, yeah, you have your, you have your href, and then you have the value of that, and there's no quotes around it. And you're like, is that cool? Is that cool? So again, here's the rule. Uh, all good, unless you have white space or one of these guys. And uh, Matthias um, awesomely created another test suite where we can just test out. So this is the same IDs as before, but we have no quotes around any of these. Um, everything gets pretty good. Even, even brainfuck um, as IDs works. That's good. Um, there are some stuff down here. So if you need a, a reminder on what does not work, you can go to mother effing unquoted attributes.com. <laughs> and um, so here you can just type in what the attribute value is going to be. And uh, so if like an a, um, a equal sign will not work in HTML, but otherwise things will work. Yeah, here's a nice little reminder. The cool thing here is like before we've kind of felt like these things are scary and so we've just kind of avoided them. But in fact, there's rules behind it and the browsers abide by those rules. So as long as you know what the rules are, you can feel confident in, in going quote free or, or keeping with quotes. I'm not, I'm not pressuring the no quote thing on you. I mean, you can leave it up to your HTML minifier if you want. It's totally fine. I'm, I'm into it. <clears throat> All right. The last is, I like this. This is fun. You can take your doc type. You can add a little bit of character to it. You can personalize it. And here's kind of the base recipe. Doc type HTML public, and then you got this little string right next to it. So you have some options. You can just play off the public. Maybe you could go with like public intoxication. You could like public display of affection, other side of things. You could just show that literally and just like show hearts and happiness. Um, this is something that we use in HTML5 boilerplate, a uh, nice little happy star. Um, you could also go with something like this, uh, go into the Unicode full-fledged. Full so this is a, a snowman being chased by three hot beverages. <laughs> Happy. Uh, or lastly, I think this is one of my favorites. This is the, the recursive doc type. <laughs> this is uh, so that you're in standard standards mode. <laughs> Feels real good. Yeah, so I think we'll take our document. We'll give that, that upgrade. I think that, yeah, that feels pretty good. I like that. So lastly, I just want to point this out. The HTML5 spec is a repository of valuable browser knowledge. A lot of it has been acquired through reverse engineering. As web developers, we do a lot of trial and error trying to figure out what the behavior is. And it turns out the specs actually kind of tell you how things work, too. So take a minute to read the spec. Uh, the W3 has a um, author view of the HTML5 spec, which has all the implementer stuff ripped out of it. Um, it's worth a perusal. So anyways, that's it. My slides are here, and thank you guys very much. And if you have any questions, I can answer them, maybe. Sir. Do you have any recommended advice on migrating from HTML4 to HTML5? Um, um, in general, it's, it's as easy as a doc type switch, right? Take out the old doc type, put in the new doc type, easy peasy. If you want to upgrade your, your markup to use header, footer, et cetera, you're fine, and you use something like the HTML5 shiv or modernizer and chuck that in, and you're good. But that's kind of optional. Um, and yeah, so just you can go piecemeal, and that's the thing is that you don't need to refactor an entire site to make the move from four to five. Um, you can kind of just take it bit by bit, and you're not going to see big. Um, you're not going to change your doc type, and everything's going to be broken. It's going to be basically the same. Thank you. Cool. All right, <clears throat> thank you guys.